Hello, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started with this afternoon's presentation. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Betsy Irwin. Um, I am the lead for educational programs for the center, and I have the good fortune today of introducing our guest speaker. Um, as many of you know, there have been a lot of new things at the center this year, and today's event is an example of that. It's our first bonus round of our positive link session um, with a summer event, which we're really excited about. Um, also, our speaker, Fred Keller, um, is new to the center. Um, he is our executive in residence, the first time we've had one, and we feel very fortunate to have Fred on our team um, as the executive in residence. Fred is a perfect example of what's right about positive organizations. Um, he is the chairman and CEO of Cascade Engineering, um, which is an industry leader in injectable, large-scale plastic molding. Um, Cascade Engineering is one of the largest certified B corporations in the world, and has been recognized for its social and environmental and community involvement. Fred believes business is well-suited to be a partner to take on important social and environmental issues, working in partnership with government and community agencies. He's put into his belief into action through involvement in a variety of organizations, including serving as the chairman of the board for the Kellogg Foundation, as well as the, chair, the founder and chair of Talent 2025. One thing that hasn't changed at the center is the sponsorship of the Positive Link sessions, which is Diane, um, Diane and Paul Jones. So I'd like to thank them today. Actually, Diane isn't here, but Paul is here. So thank you very much for sponsoring the session. <laughs> and the today we're offering salad with the pizza, which is a change, something new that we've added to the menu. So thank you very much for that as well. So I'd like you to join me in welcoming Fred to the podium and thanking him for leading our, our first summer Positive Link session. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. You've, this is a wonderful uh, day outside. You've got lots of reasons to do something else other than this, so thank you for being here. It's great to be here. I, I hope today that we can explore things together. We can kind of co-create together, if you will. So I, I think we've got sickies somewhere. If we don't, uh, maybe we can make sure that they've got an opportunity to have them and, and, and have them at their table. So that as you s discover things, that as I'm talking with you today and we're talking together, that as you discover things about that we might be able to enlighten me about or that uh, perhaps give you some ideas from what we've talked about, about what might be a direction we could go in the future, both from the research standpoint and from the idea that, of, of what we've already learned in the research that's out there. So I've got a couple of uh, uh, boards up here that we want to be able to populate a little bit, so it's work on your side as well as, as my side at this point. And we want to be able to have you think about things that would be worthwhile from a research standpoint both what's there today and what might be uh, possible to be researched in the future, and how we might approach business leaders, both the uh, established business leaders and the emerging business leaders that are, that are coming forward in the world today. And, you know, I've been thinking about for, and I've been intrigued with the role of business for, for years. Uh, I've, I've actually started Cascade Engineering 41 years ago. It's kind of hard to believe that that's that, that long. But uh, I've wondered if business could be uh, something other than just a, you know, a good, successful business, if it could actually be a, a wonderful place to work, and if that could actually have an impact on how the community in which we function works. And that's been really intriguing to me over the years. And so I've been, I've been trying to think about how that works. And this is kind of, today is, an, is hopefully an unpacking of that thinking a little bit. Uh, but just getting better at what a company does isn't necessarily good enough. And I think that's the, the notion of beyond Friedman that we want to explore a little bit. You know, how is it that we uh, just have to worry about our business and everything else will be okay? And I'm really intrigued with this idea that, that business leaders are, in fact, really, really skilled because of the, of the forces that are, are, are honing their skills 
that they are really quite qualified to be able to do some pretty significant changes in the world. So that's kind of the, the flavor of what we're going to talk about today. Hopefully that's uh, exciting and interesting to you. Uh, so let me start with this idea of, of there's really some, uh, uh, the question of to what extent can businesses be expected to solve the world's toughest problems? So I'm going to do a little, I'm a little straw poll when we start here. So you're going to have to start, do some work right away. To what extent, just, just off the top of your head, to what extent do you think businesses uh, can be expected to be solving some of the world's tough problems beyond just doing their, their own business work. So if there is a, uh, an idea that, uh, that, that oh, sorry, I, I wanted to go to this one. I want to go to the next one. To what extent does the world need businesses? So the, the, back to this other question, this is kind of what I walked into with today in terms of what extent can businesses be expected to solve the world's toughest problems. But what I really like to talk about now is for this, for this first really question is, to what extent does the world need businesses to solve the world's toughest problems? Can I give you, can, can I go just do a one to five? And uh, we'll just do um, ones first. How about ones, not at all? Twos, maybe a little bit more? Threes, okay, we got some threes. Fours and fives. Okay, so heavily on the fours, some fives. And uh, that's pretty interesting. I think that's, a, that's an interesting point to start with. So I want to say that there are lots of tensions in the world. And what we learn in business is you don't necessarily solve all these tensions, but you do work with them. You manage them. And so one of the first tensions we've got is the fact is the world has made some amazing progress over the last several decades. I mean, it's, it's much more positive in today's world than it was 50 to 100 years ago. I think we can say that. It's more enjoyable. It's more safe, despite the fact we've got a lot of stuff going on in the Middle East. The rest of the world is feeling a little better. Some of you are going, what's he talking about? <laughs> but uh, the fact is, the tension is we've got some wicked complex problems that haven't been solved yet. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about what it means to be in a wicked complex problem world so that we're all on the same page. And if you remember, you know, no self-respecting business school would ever have anything, a uh, presentation without a two-by-two two matrix. So we're going to have a two-by-two two matrix that has problem on one side, solution on the other. And if you have a problem that is pretty simple and the solution is known, you just do it. And if you have a problem that is pretty complex, but you really kind of know the direction and how the problem is going to be, you know, the result, you know, that, that, that's a project. You make a project. It's a very complex thing. You know, making an automobile is a very complex project. Uh, but it's, it's doable. It's knowable. And you just, you, 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 it's just, you just get it done. But if you have a, a, a problem that's very complex and you really don't have any uh, notion about what the, the solution is, that's a wicked complex problem. And that's what I mean when we have problems in the world that are wicked complex. So let's go to the, uh, a few examples. Here's one that's wicked complex. It's poverty. We've had poverty around. We've, we've had wars on poverty. We've had everything we can think of on poverty. But since 1965, we took a nice big dip uh, from the, from the uh, 60s down to the uh, early 70s. But it has basically been flat since then. That's a wicked complex problem. And this is not something that is going away. In fact, if we add the disparities on top of that, we've got a, we've got a group at the bottom that's kind of really flat, and we've got a group at the top that's just way beyond that. This is called a wicked complex problem. We've got resources that are wicked complex problems. I show this. This is a... a uh, uh, the uh, oil that has been, uh, the price of oil in 2010 constant dollars. It's really interesting to see what's happened over the years. I mean, it used to be a technology problem. How do you get the stuff out of the ground? That's why the price was so high in the beginning. Then it turned into a marketing problem. How do you get folks to be able to want to buy enough of this stuff? And then it started getting into a supply problem. And, and th there were supply disruptions. 
And the, the price of oil, and uh, was we were looking like, oh, good, we've got the solution. We've got more of this shale oil. We've got everything we can need. Oil is not a problem anymore. Well, except until we have a little disruption somewhere. Then the price of oil goes up again. We, the fact is we've got limited resources. We have limited amount of, of resources above. That's a wicked, complex problem. And I'd add to this one the talent issue. We've got costs of four-year educations. I think I heard the number is like 1,200% going up over the last 30 years. Uh, that's, 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 that's a tough problem for us because we need more folks through higher education. We need them to be uh, of higher quality, more relevant quality, and we have to have it at lower cost. Because people are walking out of schools so now, as you folks know that are students, walking out of schools now with more debt than ever has been uh, put on any generation before. That's a wicked, complex problem. It's not an easy one. So we have these ideas of wicked, complex problems. And we really want to be able to think about how do we go about solving those problems? How, is that, how does this world get there? So one of the ways that we've been thinking about over the past years is that market-based economies really work well. We know that. That's, a, that's an established fact. Market-based approaches are amazing at resolving without external intervention. You've got a supply problem, you've got demand, but you know, work it out, you find things work out in the end. Yet, the tension here is that self-interest and power lead to some really kind of distortions that are, not, and worse, that are not necessarily good for all people. So, the question is, what do you do with that? I mean, this is the, the hypothesis that, uh, that Friedman had was that you just focus on your own business and you'll be fine. The invisible hand thing will work. Everything's just, just hunky-dory. But my view of that is that Friedman didn't get it wrong. He just got it too narrow. It was not a matter of how do you get at this problem uh, by just being more focused on it. It's a matter of how do you get at this problem and uh, uh, by having a, uh, a, 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 a way of looking at it that goes beyond the, uh, the idea of just focusing on the, your own organization, focusing on itself. And if you add to that, in my view, if you add to that, I may get in trouble here, but if you add to that the influence of Ayn Rand, my interpretation of that is it's okay to be selfish. You get a world in which distortions take place, at, uh, and it, I think it's a toxic com uh, content, content, toxic com combination. If the market's okay with it, it's okay is what that becomes to. If the market's okay with it, it's okay. I'm embarrassed that there's a new study by the AP and Equilar that's determined that on average, on average today, CEOs are earning 257 times the average worker pay. And the CEOs of the S&P 500, on average, are earning over $10 million a year, on average. Now you say, well, that, that's okay. The market, market says that's okay. But is it really okay? What am I advocating for there? I don't know what I'm advocating necessarily, because it's dangerous territory. Very dangerous territory. But somehow it doesn't feel right. Is it okay to not feel right about this? I think it is. I think it's okay to think about what could we do as a country? What could we do as individuals? What can we do as individual companies to make a difference in how this system is turning out? Because it results in things, in my mind, a very narrow thinking of how you th view business. It says basically, decision making is pretty easy. Does it make more money for the business or not? If it does, you do it. If it doesn't, you don't. I don't know that that makes all of sense in the world. Because it starts putting things in a very fuzzy area when it gets to what's good for the whole. And in fact, this fuzzy thinking, I think, is what causes some organizations 
not to go over the edge. I use this example. How many of you were able to see my positive business talk that I gave at the, at the center? So a few of you. Okay, so the, this, uh, I, these are a couple of these references are, are repeats, but the idea that we have oil rig disasters because of a, a culture of cost cutting as opposed to safety first, or the idea that we have recalls that take years to be decided, as opposed to customer safety first. The idea that we have systems that are allowable at this point in time for someone to be able to detect my trade on a stock market and be able to race with technology to be able to make that trade before I get there and causing my price to go up so that they can profit. Of course that makes sense from a business standpoint. It makes more money for the establishment. But is it the right thing to do? Is it the best thing to do? That's the question that I'm asking. And then you've got this whole question of global leadership. We really need trustworthy, long-term thinking leaders. In our, in our countries. And the tension is that governments have not necessarily proven effective and they even appear sometimes to be self-interested. When we have folks that are elected every two and four years and they have to spend 60% of their time earning money so they can stay in power to be able to supposedly make the right decisions, how long do you think they think about these problems? Is it short-termism in our governments as well that's, that's a, a problem? Boy, am I treading on some thin ice, right? I mean, these are, these are big questions that we need to consider as individuals and in our businesses and in our business schools. How do we get at this issue of finding the right kind of leadership to make the right kind of changes for us. What's interesting to me, and on the more positive side, um, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to back up here a minute. Um, the business leaders are really quite exceptionally good at wicked complex problems. I wanted to make that point before I go on to this next one. Business leaders are talented at doing this because they have to have a long-term vision. Now, Jerry would indicate that we've got some fairly short-term folks in the public sector. 4,100 now, is that right? Or is that going up or down? 4,100 4, publicly owned organizations in the United States. Of the 400,000 publicly owned, or, excuse me, of the 400,000 organizations in the United States, 4,100 of them are publicly owned. And we are very concerned about that. They're a very big part of our, our economy, of course. But they're faced with short-term thinking. They have to be able to make decisions that are going to be advising their investors for the next quarter how much money they're going to be making. How do we get long-term thinking out of those folks? So we've got business leaders that are exceptionally good at wicked complex problems, but they're constrained by some of the structural things that happen, like, like quarterly returns. And not all of them are qualified to be able to be doing this long-term kind of thinking. But let me give you a couple of examples on the positive side that, of, of folks who do a pretty good job of this. On the left is Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs couldn't be just satisfied with just having a decent and a good computer company. He had to make things more accessible, more easily to adapt to, more uh, open for people to be able to, to participate. It went beyond just a computer company to an organization that was making computing and uh, knowledge accessible to more people, good for the people, good for business. And the guy on the right is Elon Musk, so impressed with him. He not only wanted to be able to demonstrate that a, a company could, in fact, uh, do space missions, uh, take people to space, take things to space, cheaper and better than the government could, but he wanted to develop 
a, an electric car. Why? Because he spotted that fossil fuel supply is going to be limited in the future, and there's got to be a better way to be able to power our vehicles. And he's so impressive with this, I bought one. It is an incredible vehicle. It totally disrupts the whole process in which we're going through right now in terms of buying vehicles and servicing them. This car does not need as much service at all. It's simply an electric motor, and a, uh, that's about it in terms of how you have to think about it. It's a very disruptive and positive thing. So we've got uh, an hypothesis here that what we really need are enabled business leaders solving wicked, complex problems. That would be my general hypothesis. You with me still? But it requires new capabilities and a redefinition of how we do business. It's not going to be as simple as just carving off a little bit and, and make, getting us a little bit better. We've got to totally rethink how we go about this process. Now, on the positive side also, there's a bunch of organizations out here that are starting to really think about how to empower businesses to be better at what they do. So we've got the, the Center for High Ambition Leadership is a group of CEOs that I'm a part of that uh, uh, meets annually and, and uh, learning from each other kind of thing. We've got the B Corporations also that we're a part of that's a very interesting organization. And others, uh, Conscious Capitalism, very associated with the center here and very associated with, with many that you know, the Shared Value Initiative. But what I want to, I'm going to spend just two minutes showing you a video. Uh, I hope the video works, uh, of the, uh, the B team. We just had uh, Sir Richard Branson at the Economic Club in Grand Rapids a, a few weeks ago. And he is leading a thing they call the B team, not to be confused with the B lab or the B corp, but the B team. And he explains it in this video uh, a little bit, which I think is fascinating. Two minutes, to think about what he's showing. Business makes the world go round. It has enormous power. But employed in the pursuit of profit alone, it has had some disastrous, unintended consequences. We're using the Earth's resources faster than we can replenish them. And there are two billion people still living in poverty who haven't profited from business at all. I'm Richard Branson, and I believe that business has the power to make the world better. But it needs a plan B, one that considers people, the planet, and profit. In fact, I believe business has to think this way in order to thrive. So I got together with my friend Glock and Sites and some inspirational leaders from around the world. And we created the B Team. With help from the experts and our global community, we're looking for the biggest challenges that are standing in the way of making business work better. And together, will scale the solutions. Like finding new ways to measure and value the capital business takes from nature. Or creating new structures that reward companies for making sustainable choices in the long run. We can use entrepreneurship to help close the gap between rich and poor and redefine what it means to be successful in business. Until there's a new normal where business creates profit for people and the planet. We're united with this single purpose. Please join us. Pretty dramatic way of describing the issues in two minutes. I like it. It's able to describe the problems we have, the structural changes that need to take place, and the way in which we might be able to get at this in the future. But what's also intriguing to me is the role, and this is not just patronizing, but it's very exciting, the role of positive business and the idea of applying positive organizational psychology, positive organizational scholarship to the work that we need to do as an organization, as an, or as, as an organization and in our communities. 
And I tried to describe this in this little, this little uh, cartoon here, if you will. But on the left, kind of conventional, people are stressed in a, in a conventional business. They don't have a way of really uh, participating. They, they're, they, they come with their, their whole self, but they're stressed to the point where they can't participate in an effective way. And in that case, you just have people getting by. <clears throat> there are lots of organizations <clears throat> excuse me, that are just getting by. But when you apply, apply positive organizational uh, work, people have more capacity to do their own work. They have more capacity to think about others. They have the ability to actually take on wicked, complex problems. <clears throat> it seems to me this is an, a, an important element. And as we move, good timing, Kim, on walking in, as we move through the idea of people just having a job, as Kim has put in his book, as, as cited in his book, to a career and to a, a calling, when you add purpose as our last uh, uh, positive link speaker, Dr. Stretcher, talked about, when you add purpose to an organization, does that actually reinforce the abilities of people to take on more? be able to have broader capability uh, uh, within themselves and within the organization as a whole. The idea that we can apply this kind of symbiotic relationship idea so that it's one thing to be able to have an organization getting better and having increased organizational performance but it's another one to be able to actually move to have greater impact within the community as a result of that. That is another little cartoon I've tried to add here, uh, and I'll add it in a second. But I first want to go through what I, what I call the rings of impact, because this is a notion that distinguishes how businesses are doing on their continuum from being rather Friedman-esque and, and doing good work. They're, they're providing jobs and wages to folks in, in their own communities. But how do you distinguish those who are doing more than that? So I've come up with what I call the rings of impact. And there are, I'll start with just the, the initial one, which is the mainstream business, the Friedman-esque work that was, that's being done today. Moving to ring two, which are those folks who are doing a lot in the way of CSR, in the way of uh, giving back. The limitation of ring two is, well, you know when, when you're moving beyond ring two, uh, when you are doing something other than doing it to the extent that it's satisfying the need to be thought of as responsible. CSR work often is limited by the, the, the image that people want to give. that says, I want to be, I want to be thought of as responsible, therefore I'm going to do this kind of work and we're going to make it part of our, our pitch. We're going to give back to the community because it's an obligation or a thought process. But it's, it's, a, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It, it, it increases the impact in the community. But it has limitations. There's a third group of, of businesses that are not only giving back, but they actually have determined that there's a symbiotic relationship between doing well in the community doing, and do, I'm doing well in the business and doing good in the, in, in the community, that that actually has a reinforcing cycle to it. Many times you get folks that are in the service industries that feel this way. As they treat their employees better, they find out they actually do better in the, in the, in the organization that actually has a better influence on their customers. This is a a symbiotic relationship that actually that uh, actually goes forward. And there's a fourth ring of organizations that I <coughs> label as solving problems, where at least a portion of their business is involved in solving some of these wicked complex problems. And I'll give you some examples when I when I talk about Cascade Engineering and some of these other folks, but 
uh, we, I don't, not, not, to, not to be self-serving in this, but it's dawned on me after we've been doing some of this work that this actually is working at solving some of the world's toughest problems, the, 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 the community's toughest problems. And we, we really need to have more of our businesses taking this on. So this is, a, this is a context of what it is for the for-profit business world. Now, not all businesses are for-profit. So I wanted to include in this rings of impact the not-for-profits. And the not-for-profits really are falling into two categories. One is the traditional not-for-profits, which I call A, the nonprofit world. And by the way, this is an observation, I think some work that we could do in the research area. But if we think about those in the, in the second category, when they're doing their CSR work and they're giving back, they're giving money to some of these nonprofit organizations. And the nonprofit organizations, in their, in their wisdom and in their desire to be able to make a positive impact, are using that money to be able to further their and advance their objectives. It isn't necessarily a great relationship. And we have to explore that. That's the subject of another, another talk, perhaps. But the idea that we have simply giving money away is not the same as giving money away and having it be effective. And we need to be able to explore that, understand that. So nonprofit businesses are, are one way. They're, they're part of our communities. They're a big part of our communities. And they need to be there. But some of them... We ought to be solving the problems because they're there to be, nonprofit organizations are there to be palliative. They're not there to solve problems necessarily. The other part of this is in what we call uh, uh, social businesses. And social businesses are those businesses that are not requiring extra funds, but they don't require, they don't provide any return to the investors as well. So the, the objective of, for a social business is to move from a not-for-profit not where you need extra money all the time in order to make your business work to the point where you don't need extra money for other folks to make your business work. An example of that one is I, just uh, there was a, a fellow uh, called Sam Polk who wrote an op-ed in the New York Times about his addiction to money following the, uh, the uh, movie uh, that was called Wall Street, The Wolf of Wall Street. Remember The Wolf of Wall Street? Anybody see it? Don't bother seeing it. But it's, it was so despicable uh, about how people on Wall Street were behaving, or are behaving. Who knows? But after seeing that movie, he wanted to be able to say, he gave his op-ed piece about how in his last day on Wall Street, his last year on Wall Street, he made three and a half million dollars and was really angry because he thought it should be more. He realized that he was addicted to money, addicted to that lifestyle as he had been, had been uh, uh, impacted by other uh, substances in his life. And he was so determined that he would make a difference by trying to do a social business, which starts out as being a not-for-profit. It takes contributions to it. He's calling it grocery ships. And he's fi figuring out how to get people that are in poverty to eat more healthy. All the data, all the research says if you're more healthy, you're going to have a much more positive outlook on life. You're going to have much more... Uh, a capability to be able to make a difference in the world. And so he's working on trying to figure that out. And he's finding, it, amazingly, things that we could have told him, perhaps from the Center for Positive Organizations faculty, that the most important thing for these folks that are, are part of grocery ships today, oh yes, they're learning about how to have more healthy eating, but they're really learning that to have a safe place to be able to talk about their issues is the most important thing to them as a result of this work. Grocery Ships is a startup. It's in this a phase of being able to potentially make a big difference. But it is one that is actually uh, going to be uh, taking some time to be able to figure out if it's going to actually work. 
But Sam Polk is an example of how you go from an A to a B in this, in this circle. So if this, this gives you some, I think this is the basis, I think this forms the basis for some potential research. Where are firms fitting? Are we, should we be thinking about going from a one to a two to a three to a four? Is that, is that valuable to the, the masses of our communities? Is that something that would be desirable? Is that going to give us something to really be able to sink our teeth into from a research standpoint? I think this has potential for doing that. Now let me add this other part that's another uh, little cartoon I've, I've developed here, which, uh, oh, sorry, uh, which shows that if we add this idea of combining these rings of impact with the idea of increasing capacity and capability of an organization as a result of applying positive organizational uh, uh, scholarship uh, points, we actually have this kind of symbiotic relationship which is going to be able to allow this all to happen. So if you can allow me to think about this, see if I'm, if I'm, if I'm losing you on this diagram or not. But the idea is that the impact that business has on the community is on the x-axis. The impact it has on its own success is vertical on the y-axis. You with me? So if you're a, a Friedman-esque organization, if you're a, a maximizing profit organization only, yeah, you have some impact on the community. It's positive. It's, it's the idea that you're providing jobs and wages and, and, and everything is, uh, you know, the, the community benefits as a result of that. But if you add some positive organizational scholarship ideas to that organization, they not only can improve their own performance, but they can also increase their capacity to be able to have an impact on the, on the community as well. And by adding even more, they have more capacity and to the point where there is virtually an unlimited amount of things that can be done in the community as a result of applying these kinds of, this kind of thinking to organizations and communities. So, I guess what I'd like to do at this point in time is uh, hit the pause button, have you think about some of these issues, and take the stickies out, and what's on your mind? What are you thinking about? What could be relevant to research? What could be relevant to business leaders? And from the research standpoint, if I've said something that you said, no, gosh, I know about this or that, it doesn't have to be exact. It can be, be uh, uh, approximate. Or uh, that, that says that this is something you've got to look at. This is, there's some research out there that you're a little mistaken on. I'd like to know that. If there's some research that could be done as a result of what you thought about, what you heard, would you write that down so that we could think about how that might be done? And if there is something in, that I've said or that, we've talked, that, that I've talked about so far that gives you an idea about how we might approach business leaders, what, what do business leaders need? What would, what would be attractive to business leaders? Both existing and emerging. So would you take two or three minutes to just think that through a little bit? And put them on a, uh, I know that's a tough, this is, this is fuzzy, I get it. But if, let's uh, force yourself to think about some, putting something down on a piece of paper. Now we have people live streaming, so we're going to have them on pause a little bit. But think about it when you're on this, at home or wherever you are, about how you might be able to have business leaders making an impact. Or you might have new research that I need to know about. Do we have a way for them to, that are live streaming for them to get to us? Not necessarily. Send me an email. It's fkeller at umich.edu. fkeller at umich.edu.
If you've got them, um, would you just bring them up here and put them on the board where they might fit? Good. All right. Participation. So who'd like to start us out with an explanation of what they put up there? Well, Kim. Back to Kim. Great. That's great. Great example. Who else could, could uh, talk about what they put up there? Please. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the Follow the Bill Gates thing. The, the Warren Buffett uh, one was was great when he, he encouraged all those folks who made a billion dollars to give half of it away. And he was going to he, he was having some reluctance from some of the folks and saying, "I'm going to write a book about how to get by on a half a billion." <laughs> yes. Increased transparency. Good. Common vision. Important. Yes. You, you would reduce the limited liability. Aha. Uh -huh. Got it. So it would make them more liable for their, for their actions. Come here. Absolutely important point to be concerned about <clears throat> is the consumer willing to discriminate for those businesses that are doing good work and actually do the due diligence on that kind of work to be able to encourage the businesses to continue to do that. Yes, thank you.
Communicating is effective. Uh, uh, communicating uh, positive stories uh, with everyone. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the question of prevention versus uh, the, the treatment uh, applies to so many things, including our health care system today, for instance. So, yes, that, that, that understanding how we can prevent these things as opposed to treating them after the, 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 the consequences afterwards. Others? You're doing really well, by the way. This is great. Go ahead. Right, right. Good, good. Uh, so understanding how business and nonprofits work together and, and how they can be enhancing their work as opposed to, and getting at some of this prevention versus uh, treatment uh, issues at the same time, probably, in that kind of research. Yes? I think business leaders also need, uh, you want to get them to think more like this rather than today. And uh, as a consultant, one of the things that's important to know is that it's a future company that gives examples of particular companies that were successful in different ways, not just Good point. In terms of, of providing data for folks that were business folks, they need to have the data, they need to understand the data. Others? Yes? So trying to have a better balance between what's core to the, the organization as opposed to what may be core to the giver. And we, we sometimes have givers, and I think this is true in, in the corporate world, where the giver is uh, providing something that they think is right but may not be core to that uh, individual organization's theory and thinking, and therefore they chase that as opposed to going after what they know uh, could be solving some of the problems. Good feedback. Thank you for that. Let me, um, <clears throat> let me go to this next 
uh, kind of finish here, if you will, with what I'm presenting <coughs> with a, um, you know, if there were some water, I would love that. <coughs> if, there, if the idea that um, we have some examples that I would humbly like to just share with you a little bit about casket engineering and understand the uh, the impact that we're now discovering it's having in our community and in our within our work, uh, but also uh, discovering possibly that it, that it actually has an impact possibly on us as an organization. No surprise to the folks who have been doing this research for a long time that if you think outside yourself as an organization, you actually have positive impacts internally in the organization as well. So. Uh, let me just say that Cascade Engineering is a 1,200-person is a organization. We've got uh, plants in uh, four states in, in Hungary. Uh, we have uh, a, a lot of different markets that we, we play in. Uh, one of our major markets is all the exterior parts on the big over-the-road trucks from the side fairings, the grills and bumpers and fascias and all that. Uh, we also do uh, uh, automotive work, and we do uh, uh, waste and, and recycling containers, you can see there. Uh, you've got uh, very large equipment, high tech, uh, lots of, uh, of technology in our business, lots of capital investment. Manufacturing is not an easy world to live in in today's world, uh, for those of you who have, have experience with it. It's a, it's a tough world, but we uh, are proud of what we do. We're proud of being able to have products like our hydrate water filter, which we're using for developing countries to try to help solve uh, the, the access to safe water we've had impacted about a half a million folks in that, with that uh, product so far. We're hoping to, to be able to do much, much more. But that's the, just a real sketch of Cascade. And I'd like to give you a, a sense of what we've been doing in the social side of our business with a few programs. We do Welfare to Career, uh, and we do a, a Returning Prisoners program. We have uh, uh, a racial equity through our, our uh, anti-racism work. We work with, with veterans in, the, in, the, in the trying to help place and, and support veterans as they're returning. And we have a pink cart program. So let me just talk about a couple of those uh, issues for you to uh, just give some thought to. Let me start with Welfare to Career. That one uh, we started with uh, back in about 1989, 90 time frame. Uh, we were, uh, I was having a conversation with one of my uh, employees, uh, on the, on, it was a machine operator, his name was Ron Jimerson, and Ron, I learned, uh, was a, a former uh, social worker, uh, had an interest in, in helping folks. Uh, I learned a lot more about Ron after that initial encounter, but I, at that encounter I said, well, Ron, have you ever thought about uh, being able to have us uh, hire folks off of welfare, have them be able to have folks off of uh, what we called our Heartside District, and be able to, to work at Cascade. And he said, sure, I'd love to try to help. So he went out and got a band program from the state, didn't cost us much, uh, hired about uh, eight or nine folks that, that came to, to work that uh, within a couple of weeks. And about six weeks later, we discovered that they'd all left. And we said, hmm, I guess we didn't uh, figure this one out, right? We, uh, we gave people an opportunity, but they didn't stay. And we had to figure out about well, maybe we'll just put that one on the shelf and we'll think about it a little bit because we didn't do it right. So a little later, I had a friend of mine, Stuart Ray, who was in the Burger King business. He had about eight Burger Kings. And he said, Fred, what if we do a program where I train them and then you guarantee them a job if they succeed, uh, provided they meet the requirements, and we'll have a work-to-work -work program. I said, that sounds good. Uh, why don't we do that? It's, it's, a, it's a pretty neat program. I, I think we can make that work. So we... We started that program, and we discovered that the folks that he was, was uh, having in his uh, incoming side of his business were in uh, pretty rough straits. Uh, if you take out the temp temporary uh, student to a population, there's a lot of folks that have lots of issues that, and lots of barriers to being able to be successful in business. So we uh, started getting some more uh, agencies involved. We were not a, a social welfare agency. We got some other agencies involved and asked them to be able to help us. Goodwill was, was prominent among them. And we started figuring out how to support these folks on, uh, that were on welfare uh, and, and in low-paying jobs. And we learned a lot about the idea that this is not easy business. This is not easy for them. And about the same time, we learned about a, an organization uh, or a person that was called Ruby Payne, 
Uh, Dr. Ruby Payne wrote a book called A Framework for Understanding Poverty. And that helped us understand that, that folks in poverty think a little differently, act a little differently than folks in middle class. And that we shouldn't necessarily expect that that would be a natural transition for folks. And we learned we had to transition that somehow. We had to figure out how to help them with the transition to that. We also had uh, on our team the, the, uh, uh, the director at the time, Andy Zylstra, of the um, social workers for our Department of Human Services in Michigan. And he suggested, why don't we put a, a, a social worker right on your factory floor to be able to su uh, support these folks that have all these issues. So we had a combination of understanding. We had a, a desire to start with something good. We had this idea that maybe it would uh, take a lot of support that we couldn't give, and we'd have to rely on outside folks to do that. But we also had to transition the culture within the organization to one of being very supportive of folks and understanding of folks coming from welfare. And we ended up uh, putting our supervisors through uh, poverty simulation training, understanding what it's like to live on $12,000 or $14,000 a year. How do you serve your, how do you keep your, your, your family uh, fed? How do you keep them clothed? How do you keep them housed? Uh, we learned a lot about what it takes to be supportive of, of somebody like that. And it, they, we, we actually changed our, our methodology by, uh, if you can think of a typical uh, a situation on the floor for a welfare mom uh, in the old game, it was a matter of the supervisor coming over to Mary and saying, Mary, uh, we've got a problem with your parts and the, and the, and they're not, they're not, the quality's not there. And Mary comes back with qu uh, comments about, you know, I was beat up last night. I had a car problem. I had my kids that I had to get to school. And the typical response from a supervisor at that point is, hey, I'm not here to talk about your personal problem. I'm here to talk about the, the parts problem we got. And that then ends in a fight or flight, and you have a turnover of, a, of an individual, expensive for the organization, expensive for that person. It doesn't work for the person. So now the new system where we've got people that are trained in, in being able to understand, are, under, are being more supportive. Mary has a problem. Supervisor says, the supervisor says to Mary, you've got a problem with your parts. Mary says, I've got a problem with uh, my car. And the supervisor says, just a minute, I'll have Joyce come over here and help you with that. Joyce is our social worker that works within the organization. And she's a social worker not only for are the folks on, on welfare, but also we pay part of her salary so she can be a social worker for the rest of the folks in the organization. She solves Mary's problem. Mary stays on the job. Mary is productive. She feels supported. She feels like she can be contributing to the organization. She feels she's important to the organization. Guess how the rest of the folks feel in the organization about how we treated Mary? It's a symbiotic, positive relationship that works. Now, we discovered this on our own, but it was something that was so encouraging for us that we decided we wanted to do more. So we did, that's Jahan McKinley up there. By the way, that was Amy Valderas that, that uh, I use as our poster child for, for this. Amy joined us in 1998. Uh, we actually received an award in 1999 from the, uh, the White House. It was called the Ron Brown Award for uh, Corporate Excellence. And, and we, we were around this welfare to group program, so we invited um, Amy to come with us. We had decided that it was cheaper to, to, to rent a jet and get everybody to go down there together. Mary, uh, uh, Amy said that uh, uh, she had never been on an airplane, let alone a private jet. And uh, she was thrilled. She remembered that for the rest of her time. She is obviously, we had a, a little uh, uh, luncheon meeting uh, last year, and I remember Amy commenting that she still remembered that, of course, very clearly about, uh, and that, that uh, she was very committed to Cascade Engineering. John McKinley is another example of a, a fellow that I've had a luncheon meeting with. We have a gathering of, of folks every month. We try to have uh, uh, eight to ten folks just tell me their story. I love hearing stories about employees in the organization. Jahan's, it got to Jahan's time, and he said, I really, really appreciate this job. It's the first job I've ever had in my life. I'm 36 years old. He had spent 18 years in prison, convicted of a crime that he says he never committed, but it was something that he was caught up in the wrong people at the wrong time and was spent 18 years in prison. He worked five years before he got out trying to figure out how he could have a successful life after prison. 
Jahan is an exceptional employee. He moved from machine operator to supervisor to now being one of our, our internal consultants on our lean journey throughout the organization. To think we might have missed that opportunity because in most organizations when you have um, folks applying at the, at, the, at, the, at the front desk, they make two piles of the, of the applications. One has a little box that's checked that says, have you ever been incarcerated before? Have you ever committed a crime? And there's another stack that says, this, this, this box has not been checked. So we decided we'd uncheck that box. We wouldn't use that box in our applications. We would, in fact, make that decision of whether we want to have that person as a person first. And then we decide if there was any incarceration or any other problems with them in the past, we might be considering that and decide whether or not that person is right for us as an organization. It is incredible how much we can do with reducing our recidivism rates that are in incredibly high, 60% plus of the folks that come out of prison, and they all come out at some point in time, except the lifers, they all come out, and 60% uh, plus are back within prison within, within five years. We have an opportunity as business leaders to make a difference in that situation. The third one I'll talk about is, the, um, is our Pink Cart campaign. When our uh, leader of that organization, uh, Joanne Perkins, turned 52. She was very excited because both her mother and her grandmother had died at age 51 from breast cancer. And she wanted to do something positive about that. She wanted to be able to celebrate that, that uh, situation. So she got with the American Cancer Society and asked if they would be interested in having a uh, campaign where we would make pink carts. Well, kind of put that in context. You've got trash carts, right? And you're going to have a pink cart celebrating uh, somebody's uh, uh, ability to be able to say, as they go out to the street every week, making a statement about breast cancer. We decided we would not only sell those carts, we'd donate $5 of each cart, every, every cart sold the American Cancer Society for improving the, uh, for uh, uh, awareness training in the area where the cart was purchased. We've had some communities that buy nothing but pink carts. It's been uh, a, a great thing for us. We've had um, close to 100,000 of these carts been sold now, and uh, we've donated over half a million dollars to the American Cancer Society as a result of that. And on and on. We, we feel like, as an organization, we're just getting started. One of the things we have been doing is working on anti-racism. Talk about a wicked complex problem. Uh, it's one that we as an organization feel that our role in this is to be able to create a safe environment where we can have that dialogue, where we can have some understanding of what it's like to be uh, someone of color and what, the, what they face each day. And we feel that we've made some good progress in that area. We have uh, our councils that are working. We have, I, I, there's a wonderful video that if you ever would like to go online and take a look at it, that if you Google race card project cascade engineering, it's a 10 minute video that's one of our groups put together, one of our plants put together as part of our triple bottom line annual reporting process. And it describes what it's like to, to be in that plant, and then they put six words together. What does racism mean to me? And they strung a hundred different people, put these six words together, and they put them together in, a, in an organized fashion. It's a fascinating video. I'm very proud of it. It's something that demonstrates what the power of that can be done when you have empowered employees that feel very good about the contribution they're making to the organization and what they can possibly do. So let's cascade a little bit. What are some other folks doing? On the left is uh, Brian Walker. Now, Herman Miller does some tremendous work in this area. Um, all the furniture companies in Grand Rapids area are doing great work in this, but I, I'm lifting up Brian Walker here because Brian does some great work. And a lot of their work is based on, on uh, Hugh and Max Dupree's 
um, upbringing, uh, and, and DJ, their, the original founder, the idea that, that there is so much that we can do to make a great work environment. And I have to mention Steelcase because Steelcase does such a great job of putting together an environment for employees. It, it, it's, it's just endemic uh, in, what, in what they do. But one of the things, and this is the story about Brian, is he was, they have, of course, because it's the right thing to do, they have a diversity council. And they decided they would connect the diversity council to their sales team. And they got some great ideas about how they could make modifications to their products that would be useful to folks of diverse backgrounds or diverse needs. And they actually found that this increased their sales as a result. Now, there's a case of starting with something good to do and figuring out how it does good for your business. And on the right, Yvonne Chouinard, I've gotten to know Yvonne a little bit over the past few years. I've had him in a classroom a couple of times uh, by video conference, and I've met with him in a couple of conferences. And Yvonne's passion for making the world a better place couldn't be more clear. He's the real deal. And the story I would tell about him is he had an, a store opening in Boston. And they had all the hoopla with the store. They were, they were very excited about it. And about three days into the opening, the employees started getting headaches. They started getting a, a feeling of something was wrong. They shut the store down, called in their, a, a chemist, actually, to figure out what the problem was. And he found out that the, said that after he did his investigation, well, it's very simple. You've got the uh, 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 toxic chemicals in, in the clothing you're selling, and uh, the, the solution's real easy. Uh, we just uh, increase the ventilation. He said, wait a minute. We got toxic chemicals in what we're selling, and we're going to solve the problem by increasing ventilation? This is, this, this was, uh, and they, they did a little more research and found out that it was the cotton that was causing the problem. And he did the research on the cotton, and he found out that cotton is one of the most chemically intensive farmed um, uh, uh, on, on earth. And I think the numbers are something like 4% of 3% of the, of the agricultural space is used for cotton. And something like 25% of the chemicals in agriculture are used in cotton. You got to have the. They use an, an agent similar to Agent Orange uh, a chemical, similar to Agent Orange, to defoliate the cotton so the balls are just bright white when they come and pick them with the automatic pickers. And he said, "That's it. I'm done. No more of this chemically treated cotton. We're going to use nothing but organic cotton." And they set about doing that. 18 months later, they had nothing but organic cotton, and they're selling organic cotton throughout their their their, their organization. Now, was that expensive? Sure. Does it cost him more? Sure. Does he have to raise his prices? Sure. But he is making a stand for all the right reasons, in my view, and he's very successful as a business. So there's a couple of examples. I just happened to pick out a couple more that I happened to see recently uh, that uh, are, are pretty interesting. Here's a, uh, a Skyonic, which is in San Antonio, is building a plant to convert the CO2 from its cement plant um, into baking soda and hydrochloric acid to be sold in the cattle and the oil industries. Now there's a pretty interesting application. There's a, they're going after a business, it's taking CO2 out of the cement um, manufacturing process and for coming up with two other chemicals. And on the, uh, on the right side, this is the uh, uh, the New York City Organic Waste Recycling Program, Ron Gonan, who used to uh, be the former uh, president and founder of, of Recycle Bank, who we were associated with, has been the commissioner at, uh, in New York City for recycling. And he started this recycling of organic waste, and they're putting it into this, uh, or this uh, system where they're going to be uh, getting gas out of that. His dream is to be able to have gas generated from this, which is going to be able to... Uh, how are the trucks that go to pick up the, uh, the deliver the pick up the uh, and deliver the the waste materials? So all of this leads to a change I believe needs to take place in corporate America. I believe we need to move beyond the way Milton Friedman asked us to. 
I think we need to change from profit maximization to impact maximization. We need to move beyond the lazy indicator of success as simply financial performance to, frankly, the amount of good we do. We need to move from teaching that the goal of a business life is six houses and a Lamborghini to how much positive impact can you make in the world. I think one of the limiting factors in achieving this is that for us now, the goal seems to be responsible. As if the other side of that is irresponsible. Who wants to be irresponsible? Pretty low bar to be corporate social responsibility. I think that we have an opportunity as business leaders. We have an opportunity as business leader, trainers, educators to be able to work towards a world which says there is no limit to how much good we can do. It's only our ingenuity. It's only our ability to have the kind of positive organizational culture that allows us to be able to take on some of these wicked, complex problems. And if we do, we can adopt a new way of thinking, not just about corporate social responsibility, but in fact, corporate social opportunity. So that's it. Thank you. We've got a few qu uh, minutes now for Q&A, uh, a very few, I think. Uh, please. Uh, yeah, I was one of, the, one of those folks that testified in favor of it, um, and I was beat up pretty badly by some folks who thought that uh, uh, that was some sort of liberal um, fringe conser uh, uh, conspiracy or something. But um, yeah, I, I don't. Uh, it, it is not uh, doesn't make sense to me why we would not have this in Michigan. Uh, I tell you, the, the the case history that's very interesting on that is is Delaware, Delaware being the place to get your, your business uh, uh, incorporated. And I was a part of a group that went down and to help the uh, chancellors uh, figure that out and, and as to whether or not they should in, in fact have B Corp legislation. And they actually uh, flipped the coin the other way around and said, you know what, we want Delaware. And I didn't realize that Delaware has one third of their budget comes from corporate incorporations which is kind of a staggering thing to think about. But uh, they wanted to have Delaware remain the place where they could have a choice for businesses. You can either be a standard C Corp or, or an S Corp or whatever, but you can also be a B Corp. And it, this says to the world, for those of you who don't understand B Corp, B Corp is all about saying we're going to be thinking about something other than just our shareholders when we're making major decisions as an organization. And in fact, we have to put in writing in our bylaws that that is in fact what we'll be doing as an organization. And if you want to be certified as a B Corporation, you need to take a survey and meet a minimum threshold of, of all the areas that can be worked on that B, B Corporation uh, has available. And it's available on the web. There are about 15,000 people who are accessing that right now. And, and, uh, and having an evaluation, doing an evaluation of their own. But um, only about a 1,000 so far are, are, are certified as B corporations. But anyway, Delaware was, was in the, has decided they wanted to do that, and they, they now have it uh, capable in Delaware to do that. So there are about, I think, 18 uh, states at this point that are allowing it and, and, and increasing. And Michigan is not one of those. And, and I think it it's, uh, makes all the sense in the world to be able to have that kind of option within within Michigan.
Yeah, uh, we do, uh, every two years we do an attitude survey and we measure how uh, the various components of the, of, of the uh, of people are feeling. We do it in aggregate, we also do it by group, by, by subset. People self-identify their, uh, their, their age group and their, their uh, race and all that. And so we're able to be able to have an understanding of how people are uh, feeling about the organization as a result of that. One of the interesting things that we've done in our, in our evaluation of that is we found that um, our folks, our African American folks are now feeling um, actually the best about the organization uh, that it used to be the worst. So it's, uh, there's that kind of progress in the report. Others? I think maybe we're running out of time. Is that right? Okay, good. <laughs> Probably went over time. Yeah. <laughs>